great as well. <laughs> uh, so it, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce her uh, to you today. Uh, James uh, at the University of Oxford at Nottingham College, uh, where she moved, was it a bit more than a year ago? Uh, she was previously, previously at the University of Manchester. Um, at Nuffield College, uh, Jane is the director of the William Gibbons Center for Public Policy, and she's also a, one of the co-directors of the British Election Studies. Um, in the framework of that studies in the last uh, five or six years or so, she's been collecting a huge amount of data covering two European elections, the Scottish independence referendum, the Brexit referendum, and some uh, general elections as well. Uh, and yesterday she talked to students a bit about those, that, that great data set and how you can use it. And I, I think her talk today is also going to be using um, that, that, that data set. Um, in her capacity as one of the co-directors of the British elections, so she's also been analyzing the British elections quite a bit. And she's got, um, she's one of the co-authors of a forthcoming, a still forthcoming oh, out. book, out book uh, with Oxford University Press on electoral shocks. Understanding volatile vote voters in a troubled role. Um, she's very well published, published in, in, in the major political science journals. She's also got a uh, Cambridge University Press book on um, the politics of competence. So I can go on and list you all the publications on her CV, uh, but I think um, by now you, you kind of got it that she's a star in the field and we're very happy to have her here for uh, hopefully. An interesting talk to you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you for a really wonderful 24 hours. I think the two things I'm going to take home is like, that was some snow. And, um, and the other is, you know, what a wonderful group of students and also faculty. But I've really enjoyed meeting you all. So thank you very much. I will be raving about you all when I go home. So, um, what am I going to talk about? So Ruth asked me to present a project rather than just a paper. And as I was thinking about that, it was it really struck me that one of the things that I've been really preoccupied with over a series of papers analysing our Brexit vote in the UK had been how much this particular case has thrown up questions about the basis of economics and voting for populist parties, campaigns and causes. And, you know, it was kind of, I've been somebody who's used a lot of that economic voting literature for a long time. I've always thought that it was theoretically, you know, relatively thin. It's not the kind of literature that's been possible to expand or to, to really kind of expand into loads of different kinds of outcomes. But populism and Brexit in particular really challenged me, really challenged the way I was thinking about that. So I'm going to today present two papers. Um, one is kind of much more, more, more developed and the other is that this will be the very first time that I've presented it. And so I'm really, really keen and excited for both papers, but really keen and excited to know what you think about how persuasive the second paper is in particular, but of course also the first. Um, so there's two contributions that I'm trying to make with these papers. And there was, there's one additional paper which I'm not going to get time to go into, but that's also trying to grapple with this. One is that um, populism reveals how economic voting models need to be reconsidered. So I've said that, and I think that's been a it's been one of the most important political science implications about what's been happening over recent years. Is I think that it's really provoked a lot of us to start talking about local economic outcomes in a way that we just had glossed over as a discipline for many years. Or perhaps, you know, there'll be some people say, no, I always thought that. But, you know, for a lot of the time, we were thinking about GDP, national economics, and um, reward punishment models of voting behavior. But now we are thinking about local economic and also other social policy outcomes, and much more importantly. And I think that's been one of the really important changes. And so what that does is it means that we need to move beyond simple incumbent reward based theories and variables. And so both of these theories are trying to do uh, both of these papers are trying to do that. The first paper is very much about a concept and a new measure of how we might try to tackle the measurement and the identification of that conceptual importance. And the second paper is much more about another sort of measurement um, contribution in regards to these questions. So. Um, there are three papers, this is a little small, I'm sorry. Um, so there's first paper, which is called Relative Group-Based Economics, 
Um, and I'm going to try and argue that relative group-based economics provides a new concept and measure and a basis for the vote uh, for Brexit in the UK. And that's a paper by myself, Tim Helwig and Ed Fieldhouse. And then my second paper I'm going to talk about is arguing that economic insurance against the Brexit economic risk reveals higher Brexit voting amongst wealthy voters. And then this is a paper by myself and Raluca Pahontu. And then I'll just hint at a paper that I've written with Rosie Shurex, which instead of just focusing on the economic basis of immigration concerns or the economic basis of populism concerns, we show that there's an economic basis to gender-based resentments in Brexit mode and that those gender-based resentments were a very important um, and overlooked driver of the vote for Brexit. So I'm going to focus on the first two, as I said, and then I'm going to... Um, just run you through kind of some of the thinking behind this like how do we start thinking about the economic basis of populism so if you think about what is it that scholars have identified as the common threads in populist campaigns there's three pillars three common um three common grievances that you'll find very 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 prevalently in populist campaigns across time and across space so one is economic, one is race and identity, and one is political system grievances. So we can see there that you know, economics is an important part, potentially, of why people are voting for populist parties and populist candidates and causes, um, because those, those, that's the topic that those parties and campaigns are focusing on, presumably in the anticipation this is going to matter, right? that people are going to base their vote on economic concerns. So that's all well and good. So we know that um, populists are trying to mobilize people's votes on the basis of the economy as well as on other grievances. But actually, how do we then identify that and measure that? That's a separate question. So like, if we look to the literature for what are the economic bases of support for populism, we'll see a number of different things which I'll run through. So one is work by Ben Ansel and David Adler, who look at variations in wealth measured at a local level, house price variations in wealth. And their argument is, you know, essentially that wealthy individuals be less likely to vote for populists. And they are looking at Brexit and also support for the National France, uh, the National Front in France. The other uh, argument, which I'm sure you're very uh, familiar with, is that import shocks and um, shocks on the labour market are causing support and concern, support for Brexit, but also concern about immigration, competition-based and concerns about racial um, changes in the demographic. So we have this sense that economics is important, um, but different ways of thinking about how we might start thinking about measuring that. There's also arguments, of course, saying that, you know, actually, there's a big debate about disentangling the economic and immigration basis of votes for populism. So, you know, and this is really coming into this quite a interesting and maybe a little polarized debate actually about whether or not economics is really doing any of the expansion work here or is it immigration? And so in response to that, a number of important papers have come out arguing that there's a relationship, of course, between immigration concerns and economic concerns. This goes back to a lot of the kind of older literature on the economic competition basis of concerns about immigration. And so the argument here is that, yes, economics matters, but it matters because it drives people's concerns about immigration. Um, so Carrera et al. and CPS looked at long term economic grievances, driving immigration concerns, which were driving votes for Brexit. Um, Sergi Prados Pardo and um, oh, I can't remember, Carlesina, Carlesina um, have a paper in the AJPS where they're looking at specific economic competition and um, arguing that essentially what really matters is your the supply of jobs in sectors. So even across lots of different sectors, if you're in an area where there's a high competition, then the threat of immigration um, is going to be more um, sensitive to you and that that also has populist outcomes. And then of course, you can think about wider work. I was talking about Kathy Kramer's work last night about, you know, that's really you know, arguing that there's a concept here that's basically about fairness, about rural communities that are identifying investment tax dollars going into cities with higher proportions of migrants and people in rural areas really feeling that there's a disadvantage to, to being essentially a little bit more comfortable because in a sense what you're doing is getting less investment and that's relatively unfair 
And of course, there's Justin Guest's work and Gidron and Hall's work who talk about status threat and nostalgia. And there is an economic basis to some of this. It's not just about status in terms of cultural status, but there's also an economic status argument here. So the argument is that, you know, white working class jobs were very secure, that inferred a lot more status in the past. That status now has now been eroded. And in relative terms, the status of immigrants has become higher and so, so white working class voters, particularly white working class male voters, feel that they've kind of essentially lower in the pecking order and that this is all part and parcel of driving those economic resentments and also those racial resentments. So you have these explanations for populism, but then when you come and start looking at papers that are testing some of these arguments, it becomes a little trickier. Um, so some of these papers, of course, you know, they're doing their very level best, but lots of these papers are having to take contextual data about economics and try to make inferences about individuals on the basis of the, those contextual data. And that's really hard. It's a really hard thing to do. Um, so if you think about how these things have been measured, we have contextual variation on employment, income deprivation, house prices, exposure to economic shocks, long-term economic decline, all at the contextual level, also looking at area-based data, aggregate, aggregated data, not looking at individuals. Um, but if you look at the individual level in models of economics, what you'll find is people using national retrospective evaluations as we would normally and finding that they're not having any effect. And so, you know, there was important work that came out after the US election in 2016. Diana Mutz wrote a paper and um, Pippa Norris and Ron Inglehart have been writing about this. Various different people have been saying, look, it's really immigration. It's really not economics. And that you, if you go to the individual level, you'll find that concerns about race, concerns about immigration and, you know, a large part of this racial ra racial concerns, but real racism is driving these votes um, that we're seeing in the US, in Brexit, and across um, more widely. So national retrospective evaluations are having an effect. That's not doing much work. If you look at pocketbook voting, so just whether or not your household income is doing better now than it was, that's not having a great effect. If you're looking for, like, are you out of work and looking for an employment, this isn't giving you a lot of purchase at the individual level. Um, if you ask people, has trade affected your family finances? That's one of my um, favorites. I think that's an impossibly difficult question to answer. So surprise, surprise, it's not really doing any work at, at an individual level in explanatory models. And um, a particularly interesting one, so um, some colleagues looking at the Brexit vote were looking at how your household income is done versus how, whether you think the national economy has done better or worse. And so that was, you know, you start to get some small effects using these variables. And, you know, do people say that they're economically insecure? But the problem with all of these variables, as I hope that you might start to see, is that they're not mapping very closely onto those arguments and theories that populists are saying are important in terms of relative gains and losses and so on. So what we wanted to do in this paper is say, well, can we conceptualize and theorize a way in which economics might be important that taps into those kind of resentments and grievances and the populist literature about what really matters to people, but that isn't that, that gives us more explanatory power than some of these individual level standard economic variables that aren't doing much work. And how can we also try to bridge across that kind of contextual kind of those kind of area based comparisons that might be happening at a local level and people's perceptions at an individual level? Um, so what's missing in all of this literature? So our argument is that we don't have measures that closely match the existing theories, not at the individual level, not in surveys. We don't really have comparable measures for rival theories. And this is one of my other concerns, is if you go and ask somebody, has trade affected your family finances? That's a factual question. Or how has the economy done, you know, 12 months mm -hmm. hence? You know, that's not very comparable to how do you feel about immigration? You know, how do you feel about something versus, you know, your sort of objective assessment about economic change? And so, you know, are we really giving the kind of economic argument a fair run for its money? Um, individual level measures for aggregate concepts. So we don't, we're not measuring at the individual level the things that we think are driving things at the aggregate level. And so that ecological inference problem is always going to be thrown at those studies that are using aggregated data to try to study individuals because we don't know whether individuals are perceiving those same changes that are being argued to are being taken place and affecting outcomes. 
Um, we need better combinations of those data, and that's a separate that's a separate question. Lots of those data aren't measured at small area levels, and so you're making huge assumptions about regions and about large areas of geography. And what I think we need is syntheses to think about these kinds of concepts rather than a kind of variable race. So essentially, what some of that literature tells you about whether or not economic concerns are driving immigration concerns is you can't just pit an economic explanation against an immigration or racial based um, explanation, because those two sets of concepts are much more closely intertwined. And so we were trying to really move beyond that and find a way to synthesize and bridge some of those what could be seen as otherwise kind of a strange kind of pitting one set of explanations against another and saying, well, actually, for, for human beings, these things are much more closely intertwined in terms of their relevant assessments. And so that's what we're trying to do here. And we also are going to show you in the second paper, I think that one of the interesting things here is that the literature is still ignoring a lot of kind of wealth economics insights. And so a lot of this populism literature is about status threat, about resentment, about grievances, but we're not looking about some, at some of the other wider theories we could draw on in political economy, about risk and about insurance. And so I'm gonna move on to that in the second part of this talk. So what we wanted to do was argue that there's a relative group-based economic vote. So people care about how some groups are doing relative to their own group. And that this might be a way of, of trying to bridge that group basis of um, racial resentments with an economic evaluation about how some groups are doing relative to one another. So the idea is that there's a relative group based economic vote. This taps into those ideas that there are some winners and losers. So some people are doing better than others and that that kind of difference might be really important. Certainly this globalization literature will tell you that it should be. The winners and losers are directed to social groups, but they're also um, directed to different areas of the country. So the areas is the kind of Kathy Kramer idea that you might look at metropolitan areas and see those areas as doing far better than your own area, and that being a source of genuine economic comparison and resentment, as well as to social groups. And of course, groups are made very um, pertinent and salient in political campaigns where you know, there's no doubt about it. If you look at campaign literature, you will see messages about which groups, which more undeserving groups are doing better relative to um, the native population. This does draw on some older work by Mutz and Mondak. I was talking about Diana Mutz, Mutz's work, but her earlier work was talking about how groups are really important ways for voters to organize their assessments because you can say you know we talked a lot over the last 24 hours with certain people about ego um, egocentric voting how it's difficult to attribute responsibility for something that happens to yourself but if you see the outcomes of government policy affecting groups to which you identify it's much easier to see there's something systematic going on that may be the result of um public policy, government actions. And also, if you think about the way politics is done, politics is very much about which groups are benefiting, which groups should benefit, which groups are targeted and represented by political parties. And so groups are a really useful heuristic for voters to assess who is doing better and who is doing worse as an outcome of policy, the political process. And if you think back to zero sum thinking, it must be likely for many people who are prone to zero sum thinking. That's not everybody. If you look at that literature, but there's a wide um, there's a wide assumption that if you think one group's doing better, then you're automatically more likely to think that another group isn't doing as well. We're not so good at thinking that everybody can be doing better. We tend to see these things as trade offs. And so this could be really important if you think that minorities or parts of the country are doing better than the group to which you belong. And racial groups have been made really very salient by political actors, but we argue that this should also extend to geography. So we are interested in perceptions of who is gaining, who is losing, who is gaining relative to whom, and we're interested crucially in measuring this at the individual level, because that's a way to bridge those ideas that if we're gonna argue that globalization, that winners and losers, that this perception of injustices and unfairness matters, then we, and we haven't measured that, at the individual level, then we can't argue that there's really those perceptions that really matter. So we're going to try and do that. So what do we do? We, in the panel wave 11 of the BES, ask these questions, very simple. Giving your best guess, how do you think the financial situation of each of the following compares with what it was 12 months ago? 
And so we're looking at whether or not a group is doing better or worse than it was, not whether it's doing better overall or worse overall, but is it gaining or is it losing? And is your group gaining or is your group losing? Because we're interested in the relative movement, like who is doing better, even if they're, they're not um, on a parity. And so we asked about people living in London, ethnic minority immigrants, white British people, people in my local community, and we also asked again about yourself, which is essentially a replication of the standard egotropic measure. We asked about 12 months because then we wanted to map that onto national economic retrospective questions. And we also thought it'd be pretty difficult to expect our respondents to be able to answer that question over much longer periods of time. And so we're asking them to assess which the movement and direction of different groups, economically speaking. And so you could say from got a lot worse to got a lot better, or you could say don't know, or you could say say the same. So what does this look like? What do the data look like in terms of how Britons are assessing the economic gains and losses of different groups? Um, so on a scale from zero to one, so standardized, so five is the middle of the scale. On average, the mean, um, the mean value of all of those groups is negative. So we're just looking at minority, um, about racial groups here and self and nation. So we can comparing that to how do you think that, how do you think the country that finances the country have gone? We, obviously that's the standard question in the BES already. So that's very negative or it's, it's not very negative because very negative would be down here somewhere. Um, but if, you, if you're looking at yourself, then that's relatively better. If you're looking at white British people, then the assumption is that that's, that's more negative than for yourself on average. But the average mean value, the mean value for ethnic minority respondents is higher. So people thought that minorities on average are done better than white British people. So that was a first kind of inclination to us that this isn't really consistent with reality. That's not reality. Reality is that that's actually the reverse if you actually look at public policy outcome data. So we kind of think it's important to kind of get under the skin of these perceptions and see what they might be driving. And so we wanted to then compare different groups to each other. So what happens, so now we're assuming that we're going to look at our white British respondents, which is the largest majority of the sample, 93% of the sample, and say that that's the in-group if you're white British. And we're going to assume that ethnic minority immigrants is an out-group if you're in the white British category. And then we're going to look at those comparisons of what if those groups, you think they're doing the same? What if you think they're both doing worse? What do you think they're both doing better? What do you think if you're more likely to think that those outgroups are doing better than your own? And how is that associated with leave voting in the Brexit and with regards to the Brexit question? And so what we have here is just, these are just descriptive data, support for leave by those group comparisons. I, Hope you can see that. Um, so this is if your in-group is the same and the out-group is the same. So white British people and ethnic minority immigrants are just doing the same. So you don't have any higher, you have an average, you know, 0.5 probability on that um, scale of zero to one of voting leave. But if you think the, your in-group is doing better, so white British people have done better and ethnic minority immigrants have done better, then you're much more likely to support leave. Well, that's a curious finding. This is after the EU referendum. And so what we think might be going on is some endogeneity there of, you know, people thinking that they're white British people are doing better because we're leaving the EU. Um, and we've done a number of tests to look at what is the effect before and after Brexit on people's national and personal economic perceptions. There's a little bit of an endogenous effect there, but we can, um, we worry and deal with that as much as we can subsequently. If you thought your in-group was doing better, so if you thought white British people were doing better, but the my ethnic minorities were doing worse, then you're less likely to vote for leave, just descriptively speaking. So these are kind of your remain voters. So these are the people who, in terms of like the movement in the country are more accurate. And if you're, but if you think your in-group is doing worse, so white British people are doing worse, but your out-group is the out-group, the ethnic minority, in are doing better than you're far more likely to vote leave. And then if you thought your in-group was doing worse and everyone else was doing worse and you're less likely to vote leave overall. So we have some indicative data to suggest there might be something very important about this kind of group that makes you very much more likely to vote leave. So what we want to do is, of course, take into account some of that endogeneity. We want to make sure that we're not just re-measuring immigration attitudes. Um, and so we can model this with the uh, data across the panel waves. 
And this is what we did. So we're looking at vote intention. So we have a hypothetical Brexit vote intention question that we've been asking ever since the actual EU referendum. So how would you vote in a, um, uh, if there were another referendum, how do you think you would vote? And because that's kind of, you know, essentially that's conditional on do you think there should be another referendum? We've looked at different outcomes also um, and it replicates across different outcomes. So we're using the lag of people's actual EU referendum vote choice in 2016 as a lagged endogenous variable to control for that bias and perceptions of that might be due to people's um, excitement about um, Brexit and what might therefore change as a result of Brexit on economics. We've got just over 9,000 observations. We're just using the white British respondents in the sample. And then we're comparing yourself, the evaluations of white British people, the in-group, Evaluations of ethnic minority immigrants, the outgroup, yourself versus the in-group, and yourself versus the outgroup. Because we were interested to see which of these is really important. Is it the actual group? Oh, sorry, I managed to ask, actually not put in the key thing there, which is in-group versus outgroup. So that should be in-group versus outgroup. And then as controls, we have loads of controls, um, and they the results are robust to all of these. So we have the national economy, immigration attitudes, so whether or not you feel strongly um, supportive of immigration or negatively towards immigration, whether or not immigration is good for the economy, whether immigration is good for um, British culture. We have national sentiment score because we were kind of concerned about ethnocentrism and authoritarianism variables. Authoritarianism is one of the most important explanations for leave votes that might also be essentially just remeasuring that and then we have eight um, controls for age, gender, education, level and income, which we know are important. And we also, so I'm looking, I'm going to present the results with the ethnic minority comparisons, but we also run the same thing with London versus your local community. And in that model, we're taking into account controlling for people's perceptions of groups as well, because we were concerned that when people are evaluating London, they're evaluating very ethnic, like, ethnically diverse areas. So we might just be capturing that. Um, Finally, what we did also with the um, design of this survey instrument was we randomized which groups people saw first, because we were worried that if people saw white British people and then they were asked to evaluate ethnic minority immigrants, that they might want to distance those scores if they felt very strongly identified with white British or if they didn't, um, they didn't do so. And so we, we lots and lots of extra analyses of those data. And essentially we find a tiny effect for lead voters, which we control for in the models. Um, so I'll show you just the results on the um, predicted probabilities of voting leave across those key group-based assessments. And what we find is the following. So this is for yourself um, economic evaluations. So we find no effect whatsoever if you think your own economic situation has improved over the last 12 months on voting leave. And so this is kind of, in a sense, this is what the standard way you might start thinking about, is there an economic basis to the vote for Brexit? You might say, well, do people think their own economic circumstances have been worse? That's not doing any work. If you look at white British people and you see that they've been doing worse than you're slightly less likely to vote, or done better than you're slightly but less likely to vote leave. But if you think that ethnic minority immigrants have done better economically over the 12 months, you're much more likely to vote leave in a hypothetical EU referendum. And if you think that ethnic minority immigrants have done better versus yourself, so that, sorry, this is the other way around. And so this should really be that way if it's just gonna be easier for you to, but this is essentially reversed. So this is becoming essentially more likely to vote leave the greater you think the out group is doing relative to yourself. And this is also the same for the in group and out group. And so the better you think the out group well, the in-group is doing relative to the out-group, the less likely you are to vote leave. If you think the out-group is doing better versus the in-group, the more likely you are to vote leave. We put that on the other direction. And so our argument there is that this is an important economic basis to the vote for Brexit. Um, one of the first things that I think that anybody will ask is like, well, is this really distinct immigration attitudes? Okay, you've controlled for that. Is that enough? Is this really just another way? Are you not measuring immigration attitudes properly? Um, and is this just picking up some kind of concern about immigration? You're calling it economic, but it's not really that. And so what we wanted to do is to see, well, is this having an effect 
across immigration attitudes. So if you really feel very positively towards immigration or you feel negatively towards immigration, but you think that there are these group-based economic assessments and you're willing to say that one group is doing better than the other, is that also statistically significant across immigration attitudes? And so what we find is if you plot the, or if we model the probability of voting leave, if you think the out group is doing um, worse or than the in group, so if you think the in group is doing better than the out group, then there's a significant effect for people with positive immigration attitudes, as well as a significant effect of people with negative immigration attitudes, so hostile views towards immigrants. And so we're finding this effect even across the range of um, immigration attitudes in our sample. We're also interested in this question of like, well, is this being driven by income? Because the literature would say that there are more hostile immigration attitudes amongst people with lower incomes because of those economic grievance explanations, those economic competition explanations. And so we're interested to look at income effects. And we also want to look at, well, is this a function of how strongly you identify as British? Because we're making this claim about the in-group being really important and that that might exaggerate the out-group differences. And so if we look at the interactions between income and these out-group, in-group assessments with income and with British identity, what you find is that that's not doing any work here. That across high and low, so we have high income respondents here, low income respondents here, doesn't match which way you cut it. If you take you know, a standard deviation or if you take the lowest or the highest or whatever way you do it, um, essentially what you're finding is the same effect. So just higher leave voting for low income respondents, but the not no difference in magnitude or direction of effect for those two groups. So it's an important assessment, no matter what your income level. And then if you have a weak um, uh, strength of British identity, so this is a how strongly British do you feel on a scale from one to 10, if you have a weak or a strong British identity, then that effect is not significantly different between each of those groups. And so we're finding that this effect essentially runs across those different assessments. And then finally, with this um, paper, we wanted to know, you know, OK, so we have this hypothetical Brexit referendum. Does this concept travel? And so we used a dependent variable, which was a populism score, which is not about Brexit. It's about whether or not um, politicians should follow the will of the people, whether we need a strong leader, whether um, politicians should listen to citizens. Um, a series of questions, there are five questions that make up a populism score. And we replicated the results across those populism scores for each of these group assessments. And so you see slightly stronger effects of um, self-evaluations. So you find statistically significant effects there. You find effects for the in-group of being less likely to hold those populist attitudes, more likely. Um, but then there's really strong effects of yourself versus the out-group and your um, in-group versus the out-group in terms of driving those populist attitudes. And so we suggest that this is a concept and a measure that might have the ability to travel essentially into different contexts that isn't confined purely to the Brexit case. Um, so Brexit voters explained by relative economic evaluations in our opinion. Also, I'm not gonna show you all the data because I wanna move on, but this also translates more weakly, but statistically significantly to the comparison of um, geography. So people's local communities versus the economic gains of London. It's absolutely fascinating. If you go and look at people's perceptions of how well the capital is doing across where they live. Um, it's amazing. So every single, on the average evaluation of London for every group of people across the country, across regions who do not live in London is higher than Londoners assess London themselves. So we have these really massive perceptual gaps in terms of how people are seeing the economic gains and losses across the country. And we have these really important perceptual gaps in terms of how people are seeing groups based on ethnicity. And so arguments, our argument is that those perceptions matter. Of course, it's a separate project entirely to try and figure out where those perceptions come from um, and how do people come to having correct perceptions. So that's a, another project. But anyway, um, so we argue that there's a relevant economic comparison here that tells us something about the economic basis of support for populists that we might just be mismeasuring or not capturing the relevant economic assessments behind these kinds of political outcomes. And if we go and do that, then we might ex ex 
be much more likely to find um, explanations based on economics. And we're hoping to bridge also these economic and racial explanations. Essentially, we're saying like, yes, groups matter. Yes, racial groups matter. But also it's the economic assessments as well as underlying feelings and concerns about immigration that are important here. So that's paper number one. And uh, I need to speed up a bit so that I get through both of them. But we've got lots of time. And Ruth told me that I could take my time. So I will do that without completely taking liberties with time. Um, so that was the paper that I wanted to tell you, which was a conceptual paper. And then the second paper I told you about was is addresses this concept of risk and insurance and tries to bring in a different way of thinking about economic voting into this Brexit proposition, um, this Brexit question, this Brexit case. So um, the paper is called Mind the Gap, Why Wealthy Voters Support Brexit. And it's co-authored by myself and Raluca Pahontu. I think this woman is amazing, so I wanted you to all see her. Um, she's a PhD student at Nuffield, and she's going to be very famous, I'm sure. Um, so there we are, you saw her first here. Um, so Raluca and I had been concerned with this question of like, well, there's been so much focus at the low income end. Been so much focus on economic deprivation, economic competition, and actually, that's really missing some of the important literature in terms of some of the things we know about risk, some of the things we know about insurance that might actually have some different contributions to bear when we're thinking about what should our expectations be at the low income end and at the high wealth end, or high income, high wealth end. Um, and also this has risen, uh, for me, this kind of project came out of these concerns that I had with the income variable. Um, so the income variable in social science data, you know, we're asking people to talk about their, tell us about our household income. That's pretty hard for people who aren't the main breadwinner. It's pretty difficult for people who don't want to report their income. So we have large numbers of um, don't knows on income. And it was also kind of this came out of concern that I had that we were just using this income variable to dismiss the role of economics and the Brexit votes and say, well, in, there's no relationship with income or it's really about education, so therefore it doesn't matter. And I thought that's an awful lot of a claim to make on the basis of this one variable. So this is where this project came from and I'll just whiz through. So, and um, this is the new paper. So this is the one where I'm just gonna like, you know, I'm just on tenterhooks now to know what you're gonna think about this. Um, so we essentially are looking at risk and we're saying, okay, so Brexit was a risky proposition. And I think in this sense, Brexit isn't just a kind of classic populism case, right? It's very different. I mean, you can vote for a populist party or a candidate as a protest vote. This was a vote for the biggest constitutional economic policy based changes that you know anybody had ever lived through. And so, and there were expectations that this wasn't going to necessarily, even for leave voters, that it was going to be some economic pain, you know, that there were going to be economic costs to this. It wasn't just that there's a very simple bifurcation of people's beliefs about this being very easy. There's also an interesting <coughs> question about how many Remain voters we had in the country at 48% of the electorate, of the voting electorate, given that anti-EU sentiment was far higher than the Remain vote. So the assumption has been that Remain voters in particular saw this as a risky proposition and chose a kind of more status quo, um, more safe and less risky outcome. So there's, a, there's something about this case that we think is really relevant to kind of risk. Now, if you think about risk, if you're on a low income, what should you do? So on the one hand, you should you have a huge risk if you're on a low income. And the argument has been, why did low income <coughs> voters vote for leave, given that they had so much to lose from a leave vote? And one argument is that they just didn't see that they had so much to lose from a leave vote because they thought it was all going to be glorious. Another argument is essentially that you've just got nothing to lose. And so this goes back to Thaler's work on loss aversion. And his argument was that people who are threatened with big losses and but have a chance to break even will be unusually willing to take risks, even if they're normally quite risk averse. So essentially, you know, you're threatened with these losses, but you might break even. Your position is so bad that you don't really have very much to lose in terms of your economic position. So that's one argument at the low income end. But what about the high income or the high wealth end? 
surely therefore you also have a lot to um, a great risk because you have more to lose if you're a high income or high wealth voter but you also have greater insurance if you've got wealth to cushion you against the risk of an economic shock and so if you have assets the literature would tell you that you have an insurance against these economically risky outcomes um, but you also have insurance for future generations. If you're sitting on a really large asset, a, an asset in terms of your house value, you're likely to think that that's going to be a buffer for even younger generations. For And it was one of the most kind of interesting puzzles in the referendum. Like, well, those older voters are voting for something that their children don't want and that might harm their children. So why are people, how are people making that calculation? So we wanted to look at risk and wealth and income. We wanted to bring the risk literature into this case and focus on this kind of question of income and wealth. So we've got larger, we know that there's still, whilst there's a relationship with income, large proportions of high income voters who supported leave and a very complex relationship between income and education that we need to disentangle. So at the low in income end, we might say that low income and low education are highly correlated. At the high income end, it's arguable whether higher education is doing the work of income. Um, we've also got lots of older, lower educated voters who would have low incomes but higher wealth. So if you want to understand why is it that all these older people were voting for Brexit, yes, they're more authoritarian, yes, they might have stronger British identity, yes, they might have concerns about race and all of those other things, but arguably as well, your income is not gonna tell you very much about those people because they are low income individuals, but they might have very high assets high savings, high wealth, because they're sitting on, on property values. And so, you know, we think that wealth and income might tell us something important across the age distribution. Um, so what we've done is essentially said, well, income's not going to give us very much information. So let's look at variations in wealth and let's look at variations in economic precarity. And so we've asked a series of questions, and this again was in the British election study, to try to get better discrimination across the income distribution in terms of those people who could be on low incomes but have very high wealth, those people could be high incomes but not actually have large assets and, and vice versa. So um, the questions that we um, asked, I'll show you in a minute, but essentially we're saying, yes, well, yes, we acknowledge that it's not really a hypothesis, but essentially, yes, we're going to expect there to be higher Brexit support for people with lower incomes and um, lower Brexit support for people with high incomes. But we also think the Brexit su support should be higher for voters who have greater financial or property wealth. So either large amounts of savings or large amounts of value in their assets because they're insured against that risky proposition. And also that becoming wealthier, just the act of changing your wealth should reduce risk aversion, so should make you more willing to take risks and increase your support for Brexit. So we're arguing that that's the mechanism, that you're more likely to take risks if you have a positive wealth shock. And so um, this kind of runs against the work of Ben Ansell, who's my colleague in that field. And Ben's work, as I was talking earlier, was showing that if you look at the relationship between house price values, um, measured at the aggregate level and support for leave, then you'll find the reverse of this. You'll find that actually higher wealth areas of the country are more likely to vote remain. And we're arguing the flip side. So we're arguing that wealth makes you more likely to vote leave because you're insured. So you know, the difference there is that Ben's doing the, at the air, looking at areas and we're trying to measure this at the individual level. And so we can talk about why it is we might have different expectations and why you might have different findings. So the data that we have are threefold. We have the BES where we ask these income and wealth measures. We have also a really fantastic panel study that Raluca discovered. And this is three waves of data. Um, I've got the, somewhere I've got the sample size, but it's around 7,000, 8,000 people as well. And they were very, it was a very gratifying moment because they're very similar questions about wealth and also about the Brexit referendum. We're actually going down to talk to them on Friday to find out what were they expecting? What were they trying to test? Why were they doing this? Because we were kind of essentially asking the same questions around the same time. But they have a panel study. They've asked the same questions three times. So it's fantastic for us 
They're also asking about current support for a referendum. So we're kind of getting over some of the concerns we might have about our dependent variable, but we're also able to use fixed effects analysis. So we're looking at change within individuals accounting for individual and time specific effects. And so any concerns we might have about endogeneity in people's um, reporting of wealth, we're trying to deal with that by looking at changes in wealth over those panel studies um, over time. We also have a survey experiment in this paper. We're using the BES just before Christmas of last year, um, where we're looking at both support for Brexit and risk aversion. So we're trying to test the effect of increasing somebody's wealth on whether you support Brexit, but also whether or not there's an effect on becoming more willing to take risks as a result of becoming wealthy. So um, how do you make someone wealthy in a survey? Well, I think I told people this last night over drinks, but for those of you who weren't at the drinks and I didn't tell, you'll see how we try to do this in a minute. Um, so that's how we're trying to test this. I'm so sorry, this is too small. Um, but essentially what this does is show you the questions on wealth and debts in the BES sample and also in the Bank of England sample that was run by NNG. And so we've got um, debts, we've got savings. So the total amount of your savings on a continuous measure and also, if you own a house, what is the value of your house? And so we've got how much your savings are, how much your house value is, and also how much your debts are, um, whether you own your own home. In the BES, we've got whether you own a second house. And if you own a second home, what is the value of your second home? And essentially, we're trying to pull these data together and create a, a, a measurement of wealth that we can compare to income. Um, so what are we doing? We've got the vote intention question as our dependent variable in the Bank of England data. It's taking everything into account. How do you currently view the UK voting through the EU in the recent referendum, which has become known as Brexit, which I thought was sweet. Um, and then we've got all these different measures of wealth. So we first of all have raw income as is used in surveys. We're adjusting raw income for household size. So what is your income depending on how many people are living in the household, which is an important, very important adjustment for income. We're looking at disposable income, which is your income minus the amount you spend on your rent and on your mortgage, your financial wealth in terms of savings, your property wealth in terms of whether you own a home, what's the value of your house, what's the value of your second home if you own a second home. And we're putting these wealth measures together and looking at, you know, should we just sum these things together and say it's all about your total wealth? Um, controlling for age, gender, education level, marital status, employment status, authoritarian values, but also respondents' location, because we were worried about whether or not we're just tapping where people live. Um, so we do that in different ways. Um, so I'll show the results for the BES data, which... Um, yeah, I'll show you the results of the BES data, then I'll show you the results of the Bank of England data. And of course, what we're trying to do there is replicate across two different data sets, one using a cross-sectional um, data set, the other using panel data with fixed effects. We're hoping to see the same relationships in those same those two different studies. The BES also means that we can include the lagged endogenous variables. So these results hold up um, mostly if we do that, certainly they do for wealth. And so what we find um, just looking at the British election study data first, that we find an effect here. So I'll just show you, I'll tell you what these say, because the screen is small. So if you just use standard income, you have a negative effect. So this is the higher your income, the less likely you are to vote for leave, right? This is the expected direction and it's statistically significant. If you adjust for household size, that effect becomes smaller. So it's important to adjust for household size, the effect of income decreases. If you adjust for the fact that people might ha not have such a high disposable income, that effect is still of the right or expected size and is statistically significant. Now, if we add in financial wealth, we get no effects whatsoever. So we're not finding any additional effects of somebody's wealth in terms of their savings. But if we look at their property wealth, we're finding a significant positive effect of wealth whilst controlling for our different income measures. So once we've got the income and the wealth variables in together, income is negatively associated with voting leave and wealth is positively associated with voting leave, which is what we were expecting. If we look at the total wealth, we can see there that the effect is really driven through property wealth. So that's not giving us anything additional at all. So that's our findings for the BES data.
Um, so, you know, the moment of truth comes when you look at your panel data to find out whether or not you can replicate these findings in a totally different data set. Um, so the results with the panel data are as follows. What we have here, when we're not, in, we're not here controlling for individual level fixed effects yet, we find a slightly odd positive relationship with income, no significant effects at all, and a negative effect of property wealth adjusted there for household size. But once we use our individual level fixed effects, so we're controlling for all of those possible confounding variables that make, might make somebody um, more wealthy, but we're looking now at change within individuals across the panel study, we find a positive effect for property wealth and a positive effect for a, ch a positive change in financial wealth is making you more likely to vote for leave. And a positive effect of your property wealth is making you substantially more likely to vote for leave. So these effect sizes are around about 2%, um, which is statistically is significant, but it's also substantially big enough to be important. So if you look across the entire property wealth distribution, that's a 7% increase from the lowest point in the property ladder to the highest points in the property ladder. And so we're arguing here that this is an important additional measure, it's an important way of thinking about the Brexit vote that's been really unexplored to date. And tells us something about risk and insurance, but it also tells us something about Brexit and also tells us something about survey measurement. Now, I realize this is probably going to turn into a little bit longer, so because I just want to tell you a little bit about some of like the causal mechanisms that we think are going on here. So if we're right about wealth being an insurance mechanism, what should also be true? So should it also be true that those wealthier people think the Brexit is not going to have an effect on their own personal economic circumstances. Essentially, that would be the insurance implication. And so we can look at that with the data. We've also got questions on um, when Britain leaves the EU, um, what, essentially it's an effects question, like what do you think the effect will be on the following things, your personal finances, the finances of the country, and then we ask a load of other things too. And so we're interested to see whether wealth makes you less likely to think there's going to be some change in your personal economic Oh, sorry, circumstances. Before I do that, these are the effect sizes. I'm sorry, I forgot that I had this plot. Um, so essentially, this is what I just showed you a minute ago in the tables. Um, so this is wealth, positive effect for wealth. This is for um, income, negative effect on leave votes. And this is in the BES sample, a negative effect of financial wealth. These are small effects because, of course, these are individual level fixed effects changes. Um, but we have the positive effect of property wealth in the Bank of England data, a positive effect of financial wealth and no effect of income whatsoever. So that's just to show you that how those results replicate over those data sets and what they look like. Right, coming back to my mechanism question about expectations that you're insured against the Brexit cost. So do wealthier respondents think they're insured? And we asked this question, do you think the following would be better, worse, or about the same after the UK leaves the EU? Mm -hmm your general economic situation and your personal financial situation. And we're interested in the likelihood of reporting no change by wealth. And so, and we also have a placebo test. We're interested in, is this because people think house prices are gonna go up and down and they're just gonna become wealthier and we don't find an effect there. So is it really insurance? Do people really feel they're protected against, um, about, against the Brexit shock. And the nice thing too, we also found a very similar question in the Bank of England data. So we were getting a bit lucky at this point, or um, at least we felt lucky at this point, where we were finding that we could replicate some of these underlying mechanisms also. And here's the predicted change, the predict of having, sorry, thinking there will be no change on your personal economic finances by wealth. So a significantly higher degree of people thinking it's not gonna affect me whatsoever the wealthier you are, and no effect on no effect of wealth on thinking the national economy is going to go better or worse, which is a really important null effect for us if we're thinking it's really about protecting your own personal economic situation. So it's not this kind of endogenous story about thinking everything's going to be glorious because you're wealthier. It's really about thinking that you're not going to have any personal economic circumstances. So this was the BES data. And that's the same effect in the Bank of England data, where we're also finding with our fixed effects model that you're not going to see any, we're not seeing um, any predicted, well, you're not seeing as much predicted change in people's personal economic circumstances, the wealthier you are, and you're not seeing any effect across wealth for the national economy. 
And so uh, that's kind of consistent with our argument. It doesn't mean that that's a done and dusted, case closed, you know, watertight explanation, but it gave us confidence, more confidence that this underlying mechanism might be right. So final, final, final thing. Um, can we manipulate wealth? Because we're still worried about endogeneity. We're still worried about those people who might be more likely to be wealthy, who might be more likely to vote leave, that we might be not capturing some important confounding variable there. So we wanted to experimentally manipulate wealth. And that's obviously a bit odd because you can't make people wealthy, not realistically. Um, so what we wanted to do was just see what, see what, what, let's just do our best. Let's just give a simple, small, subtle little test and see whether we can find anything. And so the treatment was this. We said, imagine you took part in a lottery and you're now the lucky winner of a million pound house. That's all respondents saw in the survey. And we assigned that to four groups and we assigned two controls. And we wanted to see whether or not that had an impact on making you more satisfied that Britain voted to leave the EU. So we had a satisfaction with Brexit question because we wanted to ask a novel question because it wasn't repeated in the survey. And we asked that to our control group. And we also used a validated risk aversion scale because we wanted to see if that underlying mechanism is right. Is Brexit more likely, are wealthy people more likely to be more risk taking um, because they're wealthy? Um, and, you know, is that kind of consistent? Is that risk aversion willingness to take risks argument consistent with why we think it is that people are more likely to support Brexit when they're wealthier? Um, so those are our two outcomes. We've looked at the effects across level of income, across whether or not you did worse economically in the past year, because we were worried that we were giving a million pound house to people for whom a million pound house is utterly life-changing compared to people who were giving a million pound houses. I've got one already. Um, but we don't find that there's a differential treatment effect, at least as so far as we can measure the interaction across income or across personal economic retrospective evaluations. And also we looked at randomization tests, we've got balanced samples, so we're not concerned there about um, any sort of design effects coming into this particular experiment. So the effects are as follows. So we're expecting making people wealthy to increase your likelihood of voting for Brexit and making you um, less risk averse. Oh, sorry, I, it's no point me. These are the risk, risk aversion questions. They've been used tons of times before. You can't read them. I'm so sorry, it's really tiny. Um, but these are the effects. And so what we have there for just that tiny little sentence on the screen, you win the winner of a million pound house. We find people are more likely to support Brexit and less likely to be risk averse. So they're more willing to take risks as a result of being given a million pound house. It's a bit gutting if, you know, because obviously they know it's not true. So maybe just for a moment they felt better. Um, so the combination of those cross-sectional data, the panel analysis data and the experiment data is all giving us a consistent story that we've missed an important part of the Brexit vote in terms of missing the insurance basis of wealth and thinking about why does the wealthier voters vote for Brexit. So that's the summary of what I've just told you. Um, we think this is an overlooked motivation. And then final thoughts, which is just a summary of everything I've said. So this is the kind of project, this is kind of how we should think about economics and the concepts of Brexit. So one is that the economic voting literature is theoretically thin. One is that relative group-based economics might not just be relevant to Brexit, right? As soon as these kinds of evaluations and comparisons are made relevant and salient in political campaigns, then we should see these kinds of evaluations mattering. And it's not just populist parties that are doing this, because we know that there's populism in mainstream parties and populism is a rhetoric, a rhetorical tool. Um, household income is a problem for me as a variable. And I think we need to do much, much better work at trying to better capture variation in people's economic circumstances if we're going to properly understand different and important political outcomes. And as I said at the beginning there, I had this other paper where I like this is the kind of final part of the project and I'm definitely not gonna present that now. Um, but essentially what we're trying to do is say, well, you know, we've said that economic resentments matter. We've said that racial resentments matter. What about gender-based resentments? Is there an economic basis to that too? And we find a sort of in, out, in work, out work effect for older and younger males in having perceptions of discrimination against men and that being important also uh, relevant and interesting and statistically significant effect on your Brexit vote. Um, 
So those gender resentments also played a role in the vote for Brexit. But that's the kind of top tenuous link to my economic project. Thank you. Do you want to give your own questions? Oh, sure. Okay. Good. Sure. Um, I, I, this is super interesting. Uh, on, on that last one uh, about the Hill House, I, I wonder what would have happened if instead of that you would just, you would have just said, uh, think about the joy you felt the first time you fell in love. And if you get the same result of that, of that then less convinced about your, your insurance mechanism right, versus just lifting the mood. Uh, and then the second thing is about the first uh, paper. So so you show us the predicted probabilities, right? And on the self um, self evaluation, the, the line is flat. And on the out group, there's a big slope. And on the difference, there's a big slope. And I'm wondering if with the, I, I'm not sure I understand it exactly how your, your model is specified, but I'm wondering if you can actually distinguish the two or if the, the, the gap slope is basically one minus the other, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not sure that just by subtracting two variables, you really get that relative valuation. This is something I've thought about relative valuation. I just think it's just a really hard problem. So, um, so Matt, remember the time you fell in love. So, so this should make, but more, yeah. So in, in so I, I can see why you're saying that. Essentially, what we did is make people just feel great. Um, but I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure why that would make somebody more likely to vote for Brexit. Well, you're more optimistic. You're less scared. So we're arguing, I mean, we're arguing that the wealth is making you less scared and more optimistic. But whether, I, I, I don't know, I just find it harder to, I, I completely get your point, but I find it harder to make the jump to optimism is definitely going to make you support Brexit more. Because that would be, I think a Remain voter would find that slightly strange, that just feeling optimistic, just feeling good is going to make you do this thing that you're opposed to. Um, so I'm not sure, but I, I take the point. I take the point about like, what have we really manipulated there? We just made someone just feel great. Um, but it's, it's a point well taken and I'll think about that some more. Um, the gap in the slopes, I mean, these, so these relative in-group, out-group evaluations are significant when you also in the model include just yourself or just the in-group. So there's an additional effect of the in-group, out-group evaluation. And if you compare the size, the statistical size of the effect, then it's the, the largest effect is for the in-group, out-group evaluation compared to just the out-group valuation. So we were concerned that really this is all just about the out-group. If you think immigrants are doing better, it doesn't matter at all about your own position. It doesn't matter at all what you think about how ethnic minority immigrants are doing compared to white British people. It's really just thinking that ethnic minority immigrants are doing better. That's a bad thing because that's not your group. Um, but we're, you know, but we are finding an additional effect of that in-group, out-group evaluation. Um, whether or not that addresses the concern that you have about whether this is, you know, the sum is sort of more than the sum of the parts, if you like, um, it does, it does for us. Um, question on the on the first paper. The, I think the, the results are fascinating, and it's thinking about the whole grievances and the criminal literature. It, it all makes sense. Um, what I'm a bit more puzzled about is um, the fact that you're trying to say that this is something different than all the other things. So you're putting in a lot of controls, and you're showing this is not about people's anti-immigration attitudes. This is not about all sorts of other attitudes and values that they have, uh, but you're still capturing something that is a bias. So mm -hmm. if, if it's not about anti-immigrant attitudes, then what, what is the source of these biases? And I, I buy that these biases are affecting people's views on, on Brexit and potentially yeah. the, the likelihood to vote for populist parties, but what is, what is the source of it, mm -hmm. all of those perceptions? Mm -hmm. So I, I guess what we're saying is that the bias isn't just about not liking immigrants. 
because if you, well, at least in so far as we can measure it, um, if you look at the strength of feeling against immigration, about immigration, then you're not finding that that effect is disappearing just when you need to control for that or whether you look for, you know, just look at people who are um, strongly anti-immigration, you're not just finding that effect there. The question of where these perceptions come from, I think is, for me, it's about messaging. It's about um, hearing repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly that some groups are getting more than other groups and that the government is focused on trying to redistribute, trying to put money into this cause, trying to put money into this cause. And it's not, you know, it's A, a message that's in out in the public domain, right? That this is something where you see investment decisions, spending decisions, you know, this whole idea that, you know, well, what about us? You know, what about kind of those people who we've lived here all our lives, we paid our taxes, you know, when are we gonna see? The benefits of investment. So I think partly it's kind of the real narrative. I mean, that would be my expectation that this is a real narrative that's out there. This is something people are hearing all the time. It's something in the debate about what government, where government is spending its money. Um, and it's also they're quite high, high, these are quite high salience investment decisions that are going into lower areas of deprivation where people tend to um, have high, where there tend to be higher proportions of ethnic minority immigrants and so on. But I think the other kind of more pernicious side of that story is that this is also seen in campaigning. You know, I think this is a message that is being said to people who may have naturally more pro-immigration views, but are starting to learn that there's a different differentiation in who is benefiting, who is losing. Um, so those are my best guesses. And the reason we haven't done the paper of trying to understand where these perceptions are coming from is that both of those two things are really difficult to, to measure. Um, and also difficult to measure cross-sectionally within the country. Um, but one, there's a, another project that I, um, I haven't finished, and that one's not my fault that I haven't finished it, but it's like co-authors that um, have been elsewhere. But we found that there was, like, when we did a matching exercise, we were interested in finding out whether what areas of the, essentially, if somebody had been campaigned to by the UK Independence Party, did they think that immigration was higher? And that there was, there was an effect of campaigning as far as we could identify it, that pe this was really driving people's actual beliefs about what was happening out there in the real world. Um, so that would be my expectation. But, I, but, I, but you're absolutely right to say this is a bias. This is, these are biased perceptions. These are not accurate perceptions. So fi figuring out where those are coming from is, is a big deal. Yeah. Eric? Yes, I have uh, one question and one general comment. Uh, the question is about uh, the second paper. Uh, so I get it that the argument is that uh, it's an argument about being able to afford the risk of, in this case, voting leave. And uh, so either you can afford it because you are wealthy or you can afford it because you've got nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. And so if such is the case, then my expectation would be that you would find a curvy linear relationship, both for the income variable and the wealth variable. And so I wonder if you've tested for the curvy linearity of the relationship for yeah. both variables. No, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And yes, we have, and it was, it's, it's kind of like a tentative curvilinear relationship. You know, when sometimes you think, well, maybe, maybe that's, you know, it's not a strong curvilinear relationship. It looks to us that it's not very robust, um, but we have tested for it. So, you know, the argument is that if you're, essentially, if you're low income, then that's already been captured by your income. It's the high wealth end that we think is not being captured particularly well at the high income, which, and we know that by, I mean, we know that income and wealth are not very strongly correlated, um, or at least they're correlated, but not very strongly, right? So there is a relationship, but it's just not as strong as we would hope it to be in terms of if we thought we were measuring those two things ad or that we were measuring wealth adequately with income. And so what we think is happening is that we're only getting that discrimination at the, at the wealthy end. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so it's not that curvy linear then. 
it's it's like there's a hint of a curve curve okay. linear relationship. Just a yeah, hint. just a hint. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I like the focus on wealth. I think it ties into uh, the whole assets, patrimonial, economic voting stuff, uh, which I think has been a, a nice uh, advance mm -hmm. in the economic voting literature in the recent years. And I agree that we, we need to find ways to, uh, to, uh, to move forward and develop new areas of economic voting. So that's one great way of uh, doing so. Uh, that being said, I think another way that would be interesting, and this is something I've started to do uh, on my side, is trying to bring in framing. How, how the economy is framed by the political actors and can, the candidates and the parties. Uh, it touches a bit on issue ownership, but not necessarily, uh, not, not, not just issue ownership. And in the case of Brexit, what mm. strikes me is that, yes, there was this economic risk associated with voting leave, but I think what the leave campaign has been successful at is to come up with a different frame for the leave vote, which is more, which hinged more on the political risks of remaining in the EU, right? And so I think it's a, it's a way to see how the framing of the choice uh, can, you know, you, you can downplay the one aspect of risk by bringing in, bringing in another mm -hmm. risk aspect, a more political risk. You know, we're going to lose control, we're losing control of migration, yeah. and uh, all the money we send to Brussels cannot be pumped into the NHS, uh, as two examples. So two examples of political risks associated with remaining in the EU. And I think, I, mean, I don't know, but can tell me, but I think British voters probably reacted more strongly to the political risk than to the economic risk. They were willing to take the economic risk because they were not willing to uh, remain in the EU with these political risks. Hmm. So, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think, so there was this big debate around the vote, around what, which one was really Project Fear? Yes. So yes. yeah, it was Project Fear um, yeah. the you can't do this? It's just a too big a change. It's too risky, and so on and so forth with the economy. Or was Project Fear the if you stay? I mean, the biggest thing was if you stay in the EU, immigration is going to get higher, right? Turkey is going to become a member of the EU. Um, immigration is going to be continue to be out of control. It's all of these risks associated. Um, so I guess what you're saying is. If there were economic risks on both sides, then we should find a wealth effect on Remain voting or higher re Remain voting. But there was an economic risk on the Leave side, so therefore we should expect to see an ec a, a wealth effect on voting Leave, um, on higher, higher Leave voting. Um, but should there be a wealth effect, I mean, I'm just sort of, sort of thinking out loud, should there be a wealth effect on those risks of these other political risks? Um, and that's of course harder to argue. Um, but you're, I think you're, you know, it, you're right to say that there were lots of, lots and lots of reasons. They weren't just economic ones behind people's preferences to leave or remain. Whether or not um, the risks of remaining were more important for leave voters than the risks of leaving for remain voters, I, that's I guess a really interesting empirical question. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer, but it's but it's very important to say that you know we're not arguing that the entire Brexit vote was the, on the basis of the economy. I mean, it's sovereignty and Britishness and identity and patriotism and social conservative values and a whole gamut of leadership effects and um, yeah, complex set of factors for sure. But yeah, no, it's quite it's really interesting. Question. Else wants to ask one. 
I was curious, I mean, a lot of, uh, I don't go to Britain that often, but when I do, people talk a lot about like Polish, you know, it's all about like, you know, other actually white people that are immigrants. And, and I just wonder, I think maybe, I don't know if you asked the question, but what the, what the difference is in framing it in terms of like, like in racialized terms rather than in, in other types of threat terms, because the majority of immigrants in Britain are white. Mm -hmm. As far as what I stared at the data once, and I was amazed at how many of the, the, the British people were white. And the other, the other question is, I mean, I guess I'm, I, what Nissan said is interesting, and I don't know if you can get it at all, but your, your relative evaluation doesn't in, incur the size of the difference between the groups, right? So we can imagine theoretically that that's also nonlinear and it's, you're just a little better off, if they're just doing a little bit better off, is that the difference? Or do you have a theory that, the, that, that it's any size of difference matters? Or is it, is it that, they're, that, that that is going to have some kind of non-linear type of relationship, whereas the, as if you know, non-white Britons are getting, doing a lot better off than me, then I'm upset because, um, and, and, and is that the site? Maybe there, is there anything you can do with um, on that? Or do you have any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, so now, since Brexit, the flow of EU immigration has gone down, but the flow of non-EU immigration is going up, right? So immigration is pretty, the level of immigration is pretty level. It's the change in it, the change in the type of immigration that's changed. So you're right to say that before Brexit, um, a large proportion of immigration, certainly the immigration that happened leading up to the Brexit vote that we argue in the other work was really crucial was Eastern European immigration. Um, but we, yeah, I mean, it would, be a, it would be a really interesting thing to do is to manipulate whether or not we're queuing race or just immigration, um, ethnicity or immigration. But we didn't do that, I'm afraid. I mean, it is a really good idea. And one of the reasons we did, we thought about tons of different groups. And we were, cons I mean, when you're doing anything for the first time, you're a little concerned about asking too much of your respondents um, in terms of asking people to identify white immigrants, non-white immigrants. Um, so yeah, so we didn't do it, but I think it's, that is super interesting. And you're right, I think if you asked people which kind of immigration mattered, it would be all kinds of immigration. It wouldn't just be immigration on the basis of ethnicity. Um, so on the size of the difference, though, we are capturing the size of the difference. So we're looking at the difference between your group and the other group, and if it's in a negative or positive direction, and it's not just a binary scale. Um, what we haven't done, which I think is maybe implied in the question is like, is there is there a curve linear effect, right? Is there some kind of increasing non-linear effect of just having a very very large difference, or just any difference whatsoever? And um, we haven't we haven't looked at that. We're treating this as a linear um, relationship only. Um, so that's I mean I don't really have any priors I guess to think is it a super big difference that really matters? Is it a small difference that really matters, or is it just is the direction in the quote incorrect or correct way, right or wrong way to the respondent? Um, so I guess we could just say, well, is this just is this just a binary difference, and is that enough? And is, does that capture as much as the as what matters? We could look at that. So yeah, we'll 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 take a look. That's helpful. Thank you. It's like you can hear a pin drop in here. <laughs> if there's no more questions, that's perfectly fine. You can uh, continue the conversation uh, over things afterwards because there's a small reception just from around the corner uh, at Careful, so people can continue chatting and maybe some of the students are going to be uh, more open to just coming to you with your questions rather than asking them in public. Uh, so please join me in thanking Jane for uh, Thank the Thank you. Talk.